Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Keep trying to decide whether I'm going to do Frank Sinatra without the stand or Mick Jagger with the stand, but I think I'm going to go Frank Sinatra here. All right, I'm not covering my own slide. It's kind of weird to talk with a giant picture of yourself behind you. <laughs> um, but welcome, everybody. Um, as Hope mentions, I've been studying Indian religions for a long time. And um, today I would just like to share some uh, basic points about Indian religions and how they can facilitate uh, the goals of animal protection and environmental protection. As most of you probably know, since you're at the Veg Fest in Sonoma County, um, we live in very trying times. It's a time of massive extinction and massive environmental destruction, uh, not to mention the animal holocaust, which is killing 70 billion animals a year. That's 2,000 animals every second. Um, so we live in a unique age. A uni uh, it's unique in the scope and range of destruction that we face in our planet. And uh, it's a time when we need to rethink ourselves collectively in terms of our multiple dis disciplines, cultures, and intellectual endeavor endeavors as a species, collectively as humanity. And we can do this in a lot of ways. We can do this through scientific pursuits and pursuing environmental technologies and such. Uh, but we can also do this culturally. Um, in some senses, perhaps humanity is suffering more from uh, illness of the psyche uh, than anything else. And uh, the humanities and religion in general um, for millennia have addressed these types of concerns. Um, but however, given the scope of our current environmental and animal crisis, uh, we're going to have to take another look at our religious traditions and see how they can be reinterpreted uh, to address our current ecological needs and the needs and ends of protecting animals. Uh, so I'm writing my PhD uh, dissertation on a field called ecotheology. Um, it's not unique to the Dharmic religious traditions. Uh, actually, there's quite a few uh, people from Abrahamic uh, traditions who are doing a lot of work in this regard as well, too, trying to understand how our uh, religious traditions can be reinterpreted and re-understood. It's not to uh, say that we throw anything away, but um, because the scope of our current crisis is so new, it makes sense that we have to um, try to re-understand what we've been handed down uh, through our own cultures. And so this field is called ecotheology. Um, I specialize in uh, Dharmic traditions. I'm from the Center for Dharma Studies in Berkeley. Um, and so I look at the, that vantage point uh, from the position of Indian traditions in particular. That would be Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism uh, for the most part. Um, so that's, that's the way we're uh, looking at it and um, trying to figure out how it is that we can understand religions in a way that uphold the mandates of our current uh, uh, crisis and cultural needs, right? Um, so basically, um, we can see uh, religious activism is something that we can engage on uh, interpersonally. You know, Hope, I'll quote my wife here, <laughs> she often says that veganism is everyday activism. Every time you go into a uh, store and you ask for a vegan product, you're doing uh, everyday activism. Well, I would say that uh, religious identity could be everyday activism as well, too. I believe that um, each of us who identifies with the religious tradition uh, partly has a responsibility to try to ensure that these traditions are interpreted and understood in a way that uh, facilitates um, the protection of our planet and our animals. So in that regard, I'm speaking to three different types of people today, and I think most people fit under one of these categories. The main purpose uh, for me in my talk today is for number one, to encourage people who identify with Dharmic traditions. Um, I don't know how many people in this room identify as either a Hindu, a Buddhist, or a Jain, but I would like to encourage people who do identify with Dharmic traditions that their traditions can and do uphold uh, the dictates of animal protection and environmental protection. Uh, secondly, um, I'm speaking to people who are curious about Dharmic traditions, people who maybe are fascinated and maybe even pursuing an identity within a Dharmic tradition. If you uh, walk through the lobby out there, I want you to count how many times you see Buddha or Ganesha or the word Ahimsa. How many people have Ahimsa shirts and Ahimsa necklaces? Um, so it's here, it's around us, um, we're surrounded by it. 
So we're obviously fascinated by it, even though I'm sure a lot of people don't necessarily identify uh, with these religions and these traditions. They certainly are speaking to us in a dialogical way. Um, so I'm speaking to people who are curious in understanding more about Dharmic traditions, perhaps even identifying, and saying, yeah, these traditions can be seen as upholding the dictates of animal protection, environmental protection. And then finally, uh, maybe even most importantly, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging a sense of solidarity uh, between people who identify with Dharmic traditions and people who are seeking environmental protection and animal rights in other traditions and have no desire to identify with Dharmic traditions. Maybe they're well established in their own religious traditions, but also, very importantly, atheists and agnostics as well too, because we are all allies. If we're seeking to protect the environment and to protect animals, we're allies irrespective of what our positions are in religion or our cultural identities or languages we speak or anything else. And so um, to reach out into a and encourage a certain sense of solidarity between people from different tr traditions and different intellectual uh, predilections as well too. Okay, that being said, sorry I don't have a clicker for my slide, so. All right, so um, oh, here's the one that I want. Yeah, maybe I didn't click enough. <laughs> Sorry, here we go, Dharmic traditions. Okay, um, so just to get into things a little bit more specifically, um, Dharmic traditions, again, these are uh, traditions that are, we, we chose the name of our school, Center for Dharma Studies in Berkeley, uh, because Dharma is a term that applies to a, a broad swath of Indian traditions. Um, and these traditions have several things that are in common, even though they really have strong points of disagreement about metaphysics, the nature of the soul, the nature of divinity, the nature of soteriology, that is salvation. They have some pretty radical differences when it comes to some of these things. But however, it's maybe more interesting to see how much they all have in common. And one of them is that they uh, all use the term dharma. Now the term dharma is a very interesting term and it's one that I think that we could all learn by in the current ecological movement and animal rights movement. Um, the term dharma means your own ethical conduct. It means the social harmony of society in terms of how society should behave. Legal manuals are called dharma shastra. Um, but even beyond that, dharma means the harmonious flow of the universe, of the cosmos, of that grand universal entity that we might call divinity. Dharma also uh, refers to that. So what the subtext of the word dharma is, is that by living righteously ourselves as individuals, that is ethically, compassionately, then we align peace and harmony in society and then our societies align with the peace and harmony of the cosmic force, divinity, God, however you want to call it. Um, so in that regard, it's, it's the individual has profound impact on the universal and vice versa. And you can see how this uh, strategy is very important if we're going to talk about protecting animals and protecting the environment. Another uh, theme that they all surprisingly have in common is the theme of karma. Uh, I think we use karma colloquially, right? Kind of get what you deserve sort of thing, right? Um, every action has a reaction, kind of like meets like sort of thing. If you do bad things, bad things are likely to happen to you. Those sort of things. I mean, it, the term has gotten so universal, it's practically English. It's probably in the English dictionary. I haven't actually looked it up, but I'm sure it is. Um, but karma in the Indian context uh, also implies um, transmigration. That is what most people call reincarnation. Um, and in early India, when they looked around and they saw the wide variety of species and animals, and then they looked at the problem of theodicy, that is to say why good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people, it seemed to be the only logical explanation is that that must have come from a previous life and that you carry this from life to life. So karma, we can see um, sort of horizontally, you know, affect in our own lives as we are here, but in the traditional context, it was meant more uh, cosmically as well, too. And then I also propose that if you want to understand these principles secularly, you can do that as well. You know, they have a lot to say to those people who are secular-minded as well, too. 
Um, another important issue is the issue of selfhood. This tends to be one of the main defining uh, points um, that distinguishes different philosophical dharmic schools. Selfhood, namely, what is the nature of the self? Some people answer eternal soul, right? Uh, Buddhists might answer a stream of ever-changing aggregates. Um, <laughs> it's a little less elegant than eternal soul, but <laughs> for what it's worth. <laughs> um, and then also, how does that relate to divinity? You know, the whole entire field of Vedanta answers this question in so many ways, but it's mostly uh, to answer the question is, how does the individual uh, relate to the divinity? What is that relation? Oneness, separateness, qualified paradoxical oneness and separateness, etc. So I'm not going to take you down the heady path there. Um, but the important point about selfhood that I think is unique in Dharmic traditions is that all living beings have the same ontological status. That means whatever you are, animals are too, plants are too, trees are too, bacteria are too. It's not like humans have souls and nobody else does. And I think that that's a really important strength of the Dharmic traditions in terms of promoting equality, uh, interspecies equality, gender equality, racial equality, but also to protect against speciesism, right? Um, the idea is, if we are separate souls in relationship to, let's say, a loving God, then we wouldn't hurt another soul because they too are beloved by God. If we are all one, to take a different philosophical position, and we are all one with God and non-different, then we wouldn't hurt another being any more than we would hurt ourselves. Um, so in this sense, uh, selfhood becomes uh, the point, because we all have the same ontological status as humans, but also as species, it implies ahimsa. Ahimsa paramo dharma. I was so thrilled to walk out there in the quad and to see a shirt with a little pig on it that said Ahimsa. Not five minutes later, I was talking to a lady and I looked in her necklace said Ahimsa. I was kind of thinking about walking around the festival and counting how many times I've seen this word, Ahimsa. Um, ahimsa means nonviolence. I had a friend named Ahimsa. He had hippie parents. And I asked him when I was probably about 17 years old, I didn't know anything about Sanskrit. I think I'd just read Be Here Now and it rocked my world. <laughs> and I said to him, what does your name mean? He says, dynamic compassion, right? It's a little bit of a liberal definition, but the feeling is, I mean, that's really what it implies. It implies this compassionate concern, this uh, radical non-harming, right? And it speaks very strongly to the animal rights and environmental movement. Sorry, it's kind of awkward that I have to keep walking way over here into the dark. Okay, I just got to make sure the computer and the slide matches. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to speak uh, specifically about some of our three Dharmic traditions. We're going to talk about Jainism, Buddhism, and Hinduism. This is very cursory. Um, I do really want to encourage you guys. I have a lot of research and a lot of, actually, my notes here have like footnotes on top of footnotes on top of footnotes. And I'm probably going to talk about 5% of what I even have in my hand, okay? So if you guys are curious about this more, if you want to identify with these traditions, if you want to know how you can get in touch with these traditions, if you want to know how these traditions uphold animal rights, vegetarianism, veganism, or environmental protection, I have plenty of resources. Please feel free to talk to me afterwards. So um, I'm starting with Jainism because uh, Jainism is uh, widely regarded as probably the oldest uh, of the Indian traditions. It's hard to say because the Vedic religion uh, is possibly older. We're not really sure. Dating gets a little bit funny. Um, but certainly uh, the 24th Tirthankara, uh, Mahavira, was the founder of the modern Jain uh, movement. And he considers himself, or he is considered to be the 24th teacher in his lineage. And he's a contemporary with uh, Buddha, about, you know, 400 before the Common Era, right? So if he had 24 teachers before that, we're talking about, you know, what, 3,000 years ago, or, you know, very, very ancient, ancient tradition. Um, and the Jains are notable... <coughs> largely because of their practice of ahimsa. It's, it's famous. As you can see on the picture on the left here, 
uh, they're wearing masks on their mouth so that they don't hurt any beings. They had an idea and an understanding of microbes <laughs> thousands of years before anybody in the West had even thought of it. Um, they didn't want to set fires because they would hurt animals. No traveling during the rainy season, trying to travel as little as possible. You know, they take their ahimsa very seriously, sweeping the ground to avoid the jivas. Jivas is the uh, name for soul. Um, and they, they have a very unique uh, metaphysics um, that demands this radical nonviolence. And it's based on the understandings of karma, but also their understanding of selfhood. Their understanding of selfhood is that each one of us has an individual jiva, an individual soul, right? And it's kind of interesting because it's, it's very material. You know, a lot of other uh, traditions, the nature of the soul is much more metaphysical. You know, it's not quite as tangible. Um, but with the Jain tradition, uh, you have a material soul that occupies your body and is actually the size of your body. And every action that you do creates this gooey karmic substance that sticks to you, right? And where you are reborn and what plane of existence you're living in is determined by how much of this goo you have weighing you down. <laughs> so uh, we are weighed down by our karmic goo and we're stuck here. And so naturally, <laughs> the way to ascend is to uh, mitigate your uh, karmic actions in a way that your soul becomes purified. It's a, it's a soteriology based on purification, right? Soteriology, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, it means uh, like salvation, right? Um, you know, Dharmic traditions kind of have a somewhat pessimistic appraisal of reality, and that is that, you know, we are suffering, and suffering is going to happen here, and there's no real way out of it. person you love today dies tomorrow, the happiness that you feel today leads to the suffering of tomorrow. We call this, it's, uh, it's been referred to as klesha theory, right? The idea that, you know, the uh, yoga sutra says, vrteya panchateya kleshta kleshta, right? All of your mental observations, if you will, are either going to be painful or non-painful. However, they consider love and happiness to be painful, right? Listen to the blues. <laughs> Listen to country western music. <laughs> there you go. Um, so with the Jains, what they're doing is this process of kar uh, karmic purification whereby they abstain from actions that uh, are either potentially harmful or are harmful in a way that their soul literally becomes cleansed and they're able to elevate through 14 different levels and uh, basically ascend. And, 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 and that's their uh, praxis. And that's why they take uh, ahimsa very, very seriously. Uh, Jainism, like early Indian Buddhism, has a uh, almost secular approach to, um, to divinity. And the reason I say that is, um, if I were going to say a, a heavily theistic approach to divinity, I would say one that um, relies strongly on uh, grace. I studied at a, a SFTS in San Anselmo recently. Uh, it's a pre Presbyterian seminary school there. And the professor who was a uh, Presbyterian, he said, Protestantism is an extreme religion. It's an extreme religion. And I said, you know, of course, everybody's perplexed. You don't think of Protestants as extreme usually. He says it's extreme because religions tend to either posit that it, it, the some, somewhere on the spectrum of salvation has to do with either your effort or the grace of God. And moderate religions are kind of right in the middle. You got to do some stuff. God will help you with other stuff. Extreme religions, uh, such as Protestantism, I'm no authority on the issue, but it's coming from a pretty good source, uh, rely solely on the grace of God. Shin Buddhism and uh, Pure Land Buddhism uh, is like that as well, too. Actually, in Shin Buddhism, they have the strongest articulated sense of grace where um, actually anything you do is going to be wrong. And then you have to solely uh, rely and if you think about it, if you really think about it, just stop for a moment and think about how many times in life you got what you wanted and it didn't work out so well, or you didn't get what you wanted and it worked out great. So we really even know what we're doing? And the Shin Buddhist would answer, no. <laughs> you got to rely on the grace of Amida Buddha. Just chant the holy name, Namo Amida Butsu, and rely on the grace of Buddha. So 
Jainism is the opposite, as is early Indian Buddhism. Um, and that they have, like I said, they have a light sense of divinity. It's mostly based on self-effort, and that's how you attain salvation. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say about Jainism is that this ethos of ahimsa becomes profoundly influential on the other religious traditions in India. Like Buddhism. So the Buddhists in the early Jains really took this ahimsa business very seriously, right? This whole karmic business very seriously. And they criticized the existing Vedic religion that relied heavily on animal sacrifice. They criticized it as himsaka dharma, a violent religion, right? And so the Jains are kind of a polar opposite of that in the sense that they took nonviolence all the way. And the Buddhists followed this model quite a bit as well, too. As we can see here, uh, ahimsa influences the first of the five pillars of Buddhism, uh, not killing, right? Pana atipata, right, in Pali. Not uh, atipata, pata root, not to kill anything that has prana, right? Not to, you know, pata means like literally fall, not to fell anything that has prana, prana being life, right? Um, and that's the first precept. And um, to become a Buddhist in early India, you pretty much did two things. One of them is you took refuge in the three jewels. Buddham shardhanam gachami, dharmam shardhanam gachami, sangam shardhanam gachami. You take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The other thing is you uh, take a vow to follow uh, the five precepts. Number one is no killing. Now it turns out these five precepts in Buddhism are very familiar. They actually sound a lot like ahimsa satya steya brahmacharya parigraha. Those are what we call in Yoga Sutra Mahavratam, the great vows. But they, uh, the oldest instantiation that we have of this is in the Jain material. These are the vows that the Jains took. Ahimsa, nonviolence, we've talked about. Ahimsa satya, telling the truth. Asteya, not stealing. Aparigraha. Right, this is, Ahimsa and Partigraha are probably the two main ones for the Jains. Partigraha means uh, non-consumerism. That's what it means. Don't consume. Uh, this is very important for Gandhi. You know? Gandhi defined Aparigraha. He says, if you own a chair that you're not using, you have stolen that chair from somebody who needs it. Right? So consumerism was considered theft. And do I need to point out the parallels between that and global economy? First world countries stealing the resources of the third world? So you can see how a constructive eco-theology can reinterpret something as ancient as a party graha in a very novel way so that we can understand our first world consumerism in a very different light, right? Um, Ahimsa satya steya brahmacharya, brahmacharya, uh, sexual misconduct. This gets interpreted in a lot of different ways. Usually for the clergy, it means celibacy. Um, however, uh, some scholars have suggested, eco-theologians have suggested, that this could um, uh, support the mandates of feminism. You know, misconduct, not objectifying women and seeing women as manipulable objects of sexual desire, etc. So even that can uh, have modern application. Another scholar I was reading recently said that uh, restraints on sexuality can help keep populations in check. Uh, taboos around sexuality. Now that being said, I personally, with the findings of modern science, think that we need to be careful about pathologizing sexuality, which is a different issue. But at the same time, I think uh, certain restrictions, you can see how sexual behavior can be harmful, right? Uh, so those are some of their other uh, vows that the Buddhists and the Jains have in common. And also, as I just cited, the Yoga Sutra becomes very influential in uh, uh, classical yoga philosophy and uh, becomes very influential. But it all starts with the Jains. Okay, so not killing, and then right conduct, and then right uh, vocation. Okay, these are um, two other kind of very fundamental teachings in Buddhism. Uh, if anybody here has ever read the Wikipedia page on Buddhism, actually, I'm not sure if I have, 
Buddhism for Dummies or your you know, Religions 101 class in junior college or whatever, everybody's heard about the Four Noble Truths. It's probably in your high school textbooks. I don't know. It's been a little while since I've been in high school. But uh, the Four Noble Truths, um, the first one is Dukkha. Everything is suffering. Everything can lead to suffering. How we live creates suffering, right? Um, it's kind of similar to the Kalesha theory that I was saying. The thing you think that's going to give you happiness oftentimes does not external sources of happiness actually tend to lead to suffering and then we have to in a sense find suffering or happiness within right dukkha then the next one samudhya right tradishna upadana the thirst for the thing you don't have and the clinging to the thing that you do have is the source of suffering right if i could just have that if i could just hold on to this right but <laughs> you don't get to keep anything right uh, third one, nirodha. There's a possibility of getting out of it. It's not a pessimistic appraisal. People say everything is suffering for the first noble truth, but everything is not suffering if you can get out of it, right? And then the way out is eightfold path. Um, and the eightfold path can be divided up into three different sections. The middle section is called shila. Shila means uh, behavior, behavioral prescriptions. Um, one of them is called samyak karmata, right? Right conduct, karmata, right? The uh, how you, how you behave, what you do, uh, in a way that's samyak, that's maybe uh, righteous or just right, I suppose, can mean equi equanimity and such. Um, and we can see that this has a, a certain ahimsa, uh, you know, when you see like um, the Vasudhi Maga, for example, Buddha Gosha does a, a nice exposition on right conduct as being not hurting different beings, right? So again, we see the... Um, the, the influence of ahimsa very strong in some of the most fundamental uh, concepts. And the other one I pointed out is this is really uh, probably one of the most important uh, precepts I've ever come across in my life is white, right vocation. And it's kind of funny because, um, you know, I was discovering Buddhism when I was probably about 18 or so and I uh, you know, discovered the noble truths very early and I was, you know, very, you know, into it, but I can never get past the right vocation. You know, I think when I first started studying Buddhism, I was a cook in a restaurant, you know, serving meat. And then I got fired from my job because I was crying when I was making the meatballs one day and the owner just said, get out of here. You know, you're in the wrong place. She was actually, a, um, a, she learned to cook at Tassajara, if that's not irony. But, um, <laughs> But she didn't learn to meet, cook meat there. But anyway, so she, uh, she kicked me out for that. And then I got a job uh, waiting in a vegetarian restaurant that had dairy products. And for those of you who don't know, uh, dairy products are basically liquid meat in modern society. There's no real distinction between meat and dairy in modern society. Uh, commercial uh, production, dairy is liquid meat. They kill the cows. The cows are turned into hamburger after three years. Their babies are taken away from their... Uh, sexually assaulted with the forced insemination, castration, dehorning. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. That's not the nature of my talk, uh, but Hope and I have written about that in our book, you know, The Ultimate Betrayal, and our book focuses on uh, how the alternative labels do that as well, too. So you can't get out of that with organic dairy, and you can't get out of that with free range, and you can't get out of that with any of that. It's, it's all pretty much, it's not the same, but it's pretty much equally bad. So anyway, um, right vocation is a really tough one. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to make a livelihood in a way that's not creating any harm because, you know, harm seems to be inherent in our society. But I'm pointing this out not to really make anybody feel bad about their vocations, <laughs> but mostly to show that ahimsa, nonviolence, and not hurting is really essential to some of the most fundamental teachings of Theravada Buddhism. For all those of you who don't know, that's the early Indian Buddhism. Now, I really want to get to this next part because I'm so proud to say um, that at the VegFest today, we have two Chinese Buddhist organizations represented. Uh, one is Tsuchi, and the other is from the Temple of 10,000 Buddhas. I can't remember the name of their organizations, but it's a very nice flowery name that's really easy to forget. It's like inspiring happiness or something, but they're both out here. Where am I? Uh, they're all the way on the other side, but you should really go visit them. The Temple of 10,000 Buddha Buddhas is an amazing place. It's, um, it's all vegan, as is Chinese Buddhism in general, right? Um, out of all the cultures on the planet, probably the most vegetarian culture that has ever existed is Chinese Buddhism. Um, they are adamant and they are unequivocal. 
I've got a dozen different references and statements here from the Mahayana Mahaparati Nirvana Sutra, Lankavatara Sutra, Sharangamana Sutra. Um, I've got some uh, Dasabhumika Sutra. Uh, these are all texts that are fundamental to Chinese Buddhism. And in each one of these texts, Buddha in no uncertain terms says, you must not eat meat. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just pick one from the uh, Mahayana Mahaparati Nirvana Sutra. If anybody reads and studies these things, check out uh, Dr. Blum's latest translation. It's on page 110. I even know the page number. Um, but he says that eating meat kills the seeds of compassion. And it comes with about uh, five pages of injunctions about not eating meat. And some of these other sutras go off on that pretty heavily as well, too. I won't go through all of that. But I will uh, say that that's a really important part of Chinese Buddhism. And I also will say the Shaolin monks were vegan, too. So, yeah. Um, anyway, I don't think they are anymore. I think they kinda, they're kind of they mostly just Olympic ja gymnasts now. But uh, amazing gymnasts. But, you know, I, the, their monastic vows have kind of fallen by the wayside. So the reason this happens with... Um, East Asian Buddhism. This is East Asian Buddhism. It's, it takes the strongest hold in China, this ethos of vegetarianism. But these texts that I'm mentioning also are incredibly influential in Korea and then Japan. And up until the modern age, Japanese Buddhists were vegetarian. Uh, actually, during the Meiji Restoration, 1858 to 1861, uh, the Meiji uh, government tried to destroy Buddhism because they saw it as a foreign religion and they were trying to uh, promote state-sponsored Shintoism and nationalism. So they tried to destroy Buddhism by forcing Buddhists to eat meat, drink alcohol, and get married. So government officials would take these Buddhists and they'd drag them in the bar, sit them down, and drop a thing of meat and some alcohol in front of them. And uh, ensure, and if they didn't eat it, they could, you know, get persecuted. So that's how it all started. And I've got this from two pretty good sources, uh, Japanese Buddhists who have told me this. Um, one of them is a abbot at a temple in Japan, and the other one is a head of a, another Buddhist church. Um, and this is how they started eating meat, and it just, I guess, became a habit. <laughs> and then once, you know, World War II was over, you know, that just kept going. Um, and it's kind of an unfortunate thing because vegetarianism and Japanese Buddhism is not very strongly related, even though they do accept all of the same scriptures of the Chinese Buddhists. This comes out of the understanding of Buddha nature. Again, this is, uh, addresses the concern of selfhood, the understanding of what is the nature of the self. And for them, all beings have Buddha nature. Uh, Buddha says on multiple occasions in these scriptures that eating flesh is like, you should consider eating the flesh of an animal like eating the flesh of your own son. I mean, it really is unequivocal because those beings are Tathagatagarbha. They have the Buddha nature just like you do. You know, in a sense, they are Buddha. And to kill them is to you know, assault your own spiritual progress. And so that's uh, where the... Um, Chinese Buddhists fall on the situation. I will uh, mention, if I can back up a little bit and talk about the ancient Indian tradition, you got to understand that Buddhism and vegetarianism is like a hot issue. I mean, it's like seriously controversial. Um, it's a big deal. Um, oddly enough, like actually people who are clergy within Buddhism tend not to be as like triggered by it as kind of like lay practitioners or people who like only know a little bit about Buddhism. I've confronted multiple different clergy members on vegetarianism and Buddhism and congregations that like, you know, will sell meat as their fundraisers and such like that. And they kind of like, you know, stare at their feet while I'm scolding them. and <laughs> I don't really levy much of a defense. Um, but then, you know, people who will argue very strongly for Buddhists eating meat do so on very shaky ground. And a lot of that shaky ground has to do with the early Indian tradition. Um, just to make a long story short, basically the injunction in the ancient Pali canon, the earliest strata of the Buddhist literature, Buddha, it's true, Buddha does not advocate vegetarianism. But he says, if you're going to eat meat, you have to make sure you didn't hear it being killed, you didn't see it being killed, and you cannot have it killed for you. All right? Do you guys know the term freegan? You guys know freegan? Uh, Freegan is, uh, there's a great episode on it on The Good Family. It's on uh, uh, YouTube. You <laughs> should watch it. It's hilarious. But um, a Freegan is somebody who doesn't agree with animal agriculture, 
but doesn't uh, contribute to the supply and demand of animal products. So this, you know, the, the feeling is that like, you're like this like a homeless you know, vegan kid who's you know, begging for change on the corner and somebody drops off you know, some chicken McNuggets. You know, that they weren't going to eat and they were going to throw them away. And you just kind of like eat them, right? That, that's actually kind of the form of meat eating, the only form of meat eating that the Buddha approved of. And that was because these monks were wandering around, you know, starving and begging. But also because of a unique uh, situation that we called uh, Dharmakshetra, right? No, not the opening verse of the Bhagavad Gita, different Dharmakshetra. Um, whereby the, um, the monk who's begging for alms becomes the field of merit for the laity. The laity, by their professions, et cetera, let's say they're a butcher, they're getting bad karma, right? Um, the way that they can cleanse that bad karma is giving to the Buddhists to help purify their karma. So actually the Buddhists see it as an act of compassion to accept it to purify the karma of the person given it, right? Um, however, Buddhists were not allowed to travel during the rainy season for fear of stepping on bugs. And you'd be hard pressed to find a situation where one could eat meat in modern society that would somehow be approved of. So based on the injunctions uh, and even the earliest strata of Buddhism, I think it's very, very, very hard, uh, if not impossible, to eat meat at all in the modern age. Okay, so that's Buddhism. All right, the next section that I would like to cover is Hinduism. Okay, I will qualify this statement by saying that there's a lot of, I don't know how to say this in a way that doesn't sound weird, but there's a lot of Hindus who don't like the word Hinduism. Um, the argument here, and actually, um, we also have a wonderful, the, the argument is that they like the term Sanatana Dharma. They see Hinduism as being like a sectarian term Right? It was also one that was created by foreigners, and you can imagine you know, people in India are a little sensitive about imperialism and foreigners dictating things and such. Um, it was actually a Parsi word that was used to describe the Indus Valley civilization and uh, the Indus River Valley. And it's actually it's a word that doesn't even come from India, is kind of the long and the short of it. Um, so a lot of uh, Hindus these days uh, prefer the term Sanatana Dharma. Uh, I use the term Hinduism just because it's accepted People use it. People know what I'm talking about. If I walk up here and start talking Sanatana Dharma, everybody's going to think I'm talking Sanskrit or something. Um, but that was true. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, so we do have one organization here uh, with uh, ISKCON. And these guys are Vaishnavs. They're a particular branch of uh, H Hindus over here. They're um, my friends, Dina Bandhu and Lalita. So I encourage you to go see their table. Uh, the founder of that tradition, Srila Prabhupada, came over here in 1965. Um, and there's actually a nice book called Holy Cow, written about, oh, otherwise known as Hare Krishnas, right? Um, written about, no, they don't go to airports. That's been illegal since 1993. Um, but <laughs> anyway, um, they, they've done a lot to promote vegetarianism in Western culture. And some, uh, some analysts and some scholars actually argue that vegetarianism wouldn't be as strong in modern society had it not been for their particularly unique way of proselytizing. And that involved feeding people, right? <laughs> and it worked. If you've ever eaten at a Govinda, as you know, <laughs> and then you listen and then you pick up some literature. And uh, so they really did a lot to spread the modern vegetarian movement. So anyway, they're, they're very um, wonderful advocates and allies for us in the animal rights movement. Um, so anyway, um, when I talk about uh, Hinduism, I usually teach it in multiple different ways, but one way that we can look at this is in like strata of literature. The most ancient literature accepted by Hindus is the Vedas. Then the Brahmanas are a commentary on that, and the Upanishads are a commentary on that, so it's like a layer. And then the three other texts that I've selected to talk about are the Yoga Sutra, the Mahabharata, and the Bhagavad Gita. I really think the Yoga Sutra is like the coolest text right now because it's like, I mean, it was, it was kind of important in ancient India. You know, it, it basically becomes a seminal work for one of the major philosophical schools of yoga. Yoga is a classical Indian philosophy. Um, but it's kind of getting new life because of the modern yoga movement. It's so rad because, like, people who, like, don't know anything or really even care about Indian religion are suddenly reading the Yoga Sutra. It happened to me, you know, 15 years ago. I was taking yoga classes or whatever. I was kind of interested in this stuff. 
And I just decided to like randomly memorize the entire Yoga Sutra, and I did, you know, and it was rad. It changed my life forever. Um, but a lot of that was because of the influence of the modern yoga movement, right? Um, so it's a neat text, and it's a good one to refer to. Uh, so in the ancient Vedas, um, we see a strong reverence for life. You know, deities are, uh, or excuse me, natural features, rivers, the sky, the clouds, uh, fire, these kind of natural elements are divinized and personified as actual deities. So you see the strong reverence and sacredness for life, if not a strong, uh, if there's really no vegetarianism uh, in, that, in those, that particular body of literature. But that's not to say that it's not conducive to uh, seeing life and seeing nature as sacred. Um, and it's a very, very ancient uh, body of texts. Um, the Brahmanas, a little bit later, um, there are some injunctions. We see our earliest injunctions against killing animals, you know, uh, injunctions against killing cows and bulls, you know, our first uh, uh, kind of instances of uh, cow veneration. Um, and then by the Upanishads, even though there's not really um, vegetarianism emphasized in there, we start seeing uh, the strength of karma theory. And karma theory really kind of rocks everybody's world because all of a sudden there's the possibility that like if you hurt an animal, you could be reborn as that animal, right? Um, the, uh, it says in the Manava Dharma Shastra that you will be reborn for as many hairs as that animal head on the body. Uh, there's a story in the Jataka tales in the early Buddhist strata about uh, a goat. He was actually the Buddha in one of his previous incarnations and he's being led to a slaughter and uh, first he starts laughing and then he starts crying. And the Brahmana who's about to slaughter him says, you know, well, why are you laughing? He says, because I just realized that this is my 500th time being reborn an animal and being slaughtered. And next time I get to be reborn a human. And he says, well, why did you cry? He says, because I realized that you're going to be reborn 500 times now. So this is what karma theory does when you understand things in this way. I wanted to say something about religious truth. Religious truth is not truth necessarily in the same way that scientific truth is objectifiable, tangible streams of data based off of cause and effect. Maybe cause and effect are important. But religious truth has causal efficacy. If something is real, it can cause something else to happen. This is a Buddhist argument, you know, Tattva uh, Samgraha, I believe, Shantaraksika uh, makes this argument that you determine if something's real based on whether it has causal efficacy, if it can cause something to happen, right? So, in that sense, religious truths cause us to act and cause us to behave in a certain way. They cause us to have various different experiences. They cause us to intensify certain emotions and mitigate others. They cause us to treat others in a certain way. They cause us to model society in a certain way. Uh, so these have truths. Um, I consider myself deeply religious to a variety of um, Dharmic traditions. And I'm an ardent believer in reincarnation and karma. However, I can't really tell you for sure what happens after you die. Because to me, that's not really the point. To me, the point is, I don't want to hurt anyone because I don't want to be reborn an animal a million times. And in that sense, it's true. And that's good enough for me. I know that's not everybody's uh, understanding of religious truth, but that's the one that I like. Um, so anyway, uh, with these articulations of karma, we see how people want to hurt less. People start following ahimsa more. There's a nice um, reference to Ahimsa in the Yoga Sutra. Ahimsa pratistayam satatsam nidhau viratyagya, right? Uh, when one practices nonviolence, there's a tyaga avaira. There's an absence of hostility, right? Have you ever met a peaceful person? Have you ever seen a peaceful person in a situation of conflict? It's the coolest thing, right? There's all these stories about a, uh, Gandhi cruising around in India, you know, creating a ruckus, and some thugs are hired to go kill him, and then next thing you know, they're at his feet crying. Right? <laughs> Several stories like these. This is what this sutra means. Ahimsa It means when one practices ahimsa, there's an abandonment of hostility for those who are in their presence. Right? Is that right? 
you, uh, you make societal, society peaceful by your own conduct. There's the subtext on that. And it's a very important point in the Yoga Sutra, and Vyasa explains it as never hurting any beings at any time. There's a number of references to ahimsa and vegetarianism in the Mahabharata. Uh, my favorite is the uh, discourse between Bhishma and Yudhishthira. After the horrible holocaust of the Kurukshetra war, Bhishma has been pierced a hundred times with arrows and he's laying on the ground waiting to die. And Yudhishthira, the Puric victor of the battle, goes to the grand sire Bhishma to teach him how to rule before he dies. And what does Bhishma do? He takes this opportunity to ensure that Yudhishthira does not eat meat. <laughs> it's a wonderful reference. Um, I have uh, citations for that if you're interested. Um, and then last, my beloved Bhagavad Gita. I spend two hours every morning reading it. And I've been doing that for many, 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 many years. And every day I discover something new, um, if not a hundred things. Um, there are several injunctions against self selfishness engaging in the world, lokasam garaha, right? Seeing other beings as yourself. We're talking about selfhood, you know? They're ontologically the same. We might be different on the outside, in the material level, but we're all the same on the inside. And that is a central teaching of all these dharmic traditions, and it's very strong. Uh, we're supposed to see all beings, vidya, vinaya, sampane, brahmane, gavi, hastini, you know, seeing all beings as, uh, as equal, right? Sarva Bhutta Hite Rataha, treating all beings with love and respect. This is all in Bhagavad Gita. And beyond that, my favorite aspect, Pratijane uh, Priyosime, Krishna tells us, I promise you that you are my beloved. That means we're beloved to God. God loves us, and God loves other beings. So if you were to hurt other beings, according to the Bhagavad Gita, then you're going to hurt those who are beloved by God. And we wouldn't do that, because we're here to serve. Um, so this is the central message of the Bhagavad Gita. That's actually the crescendo in the 18th chapter. It ends with this beautiful statement of love, right? And that we're all beloved. And therefore, you cannot harm anyone, because we are all beloved. So this is the important central message of the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, I just want to close this uh, lecture again with talking about the importance of uh, constructive eco-theology. Um, all of the things and all the texts and all the teachings and schools and literature that I've discussed in the last hour um, are very, very, very ancient, but they all have a potential to apply to our modern situation. If I can impress one point upon you today, I'd like to impress upon you two points, <laughs> five points. Um, the more I think, the more points I have. Uh, religion is a power, right? Um, somebody criticized Gandhi one time for uh, being religious since religion has been responsible for so much destruction throughout history. And Gandhi said, who's responsible? The people who are religious or the people who abandon religion? I'm not here to proselytize, but I do want to say if you do hold a religious identity, I encourage you to try to understand that identity and teach it to people in a way that upholds the dictates of animal protection, environmental protection, or else somebody else will interpret that tradition for you. Thank you.